Welcome to this small tutorial about Fixit Networks, the new computer mod for Satisfactory. Today I will show you how to use it in a basic manner by setting up a basic computer network and then interacting with some of its components. And we also will talk about some, well let's say, background stuff so you are aware how the stuff internally works a little bit. So first of all, if you want to code something or interact with a computer network, you will need a computer. For that you have a computer case. So in this computer case provides a small little window where you can place in modules like a CPU. This is a CPU tier 1 for lure code. Later on there will be different CPUs which, uh, which can handle different languages or, uh, and with different speeds. But right now you just have a tier 1 CPU for lure code. Next up we uh, take a little bit of RAM. That one provides simple a little bit virtual RAM. So that means your computer can rather, uh, run out of memory depending on how much memory you allocate. Then we also uh, then we also need to give us with pack utilities, <laughs> or you just craft it if you want to, a so-called Lua EEP ROM. This Lua EEP ROM, this is basically just a EEP ROM specifically for Lua code. So um, for different CPUs, you might need to use different EEP ROMs. This EEP ROM basically holds the general uh, data, uh, the basic program or BIOS. If you, so you can just Take one, drag and drop it onto the EEPROM slot, and it's inserted. Now you can see this warning message did appear, uh, did disappear. And now we can code in here a little bit. So this here is a small little coding window where where you can code the EEPROM. Down here you can find a small little window with a input and output console window, or not really a console. It's just some minor text input and output for easy debugging purposes mainly. On the left, you can see a small little debug win network debug window, you can uh, which you can also find with the network manager tool. Up here, you can have the ID of this computer. This is the nick field of this computer, so you can give it a nick. Then here, you have seen uh, this list entry has changed because this is a list of all the components existing in the network. You can see here the network name and the ID. And you can also click on one of these components in this list to copy this ID into a clipboard so you can easily paste it in here and work with it. So uh, before we start coding, uh, I introduce you to the power button. So that one shows you some uh, stuff. So, for, uh, so first of all, you can start and stop the computer accordingly. Uh, this LED shows if the PC is running or not. And if this LED is uh, lit up, that means the PC crashed. So now let's build a small little uh, component for that. Uh, we take the modular panel, a large control panel. So that one is very similar to uh, this model of window in here. So you can take modules, place it in here as you want to. And uh, with them you can then interact. So this is just a small little button and you can click on it and it does some stuff. So now we need to connect those two, so for that we can take a network cable, just simply connect them. You can also take a network pole if you want to, to extend the, uh, uh, to extend the line. You can connect er everything to a network, uh, uh, to a network via network cables if one of, uh, th uh, one of these conditions are filled. So the mm, the thing you want to attach needs to have a network connector. So those two already provide a network connector, so that's why I can connect them. If they don't provide a connector, then uh, you can uh, if the if the object has a power connector, then an adapter will be attached, and it will look like the uh, the network cable is attached to the power connector of that object. Let me show you that. So we go to just simply to, uh, to production, take the constructor out of there, rotate it a little bit, and as you can see, that one has a power connector, and I can now go in here to network, and then simply uh, connect it. Okay, that's why I uh, d uh, don't have a. Well, we should use a network pole, as you can see. 
So, and now I can connect it as you can see it connects to that power connector. So that one is now connected and you can also interact uh, with it now via the network. So as you can see, we now have four entries because one of them is the pole, computer, panel and the constructor. Modules are not, uh, such modules are no components. Components mean anything you can attach to a network and that has a network address. So if you just have an instance of something in Lua, we have instance system to, uh, which, uh, which allows you to access some functions of different objects. And a module is just an instance, not a component, because this module doesn't have its own ID. The ID is provided by the panel. You still can access the model because the panel provides a function allowing you to access this model this module and this will return an instance of that mo uh, module and through that you have functions to interact with that module you can interact with any kind of network component by the, uh, by the usage of the network manager the network manager allows you to target any building that has an uh, that is uh, is counted as a network component as a net or has, has a network adapter attached can open it up and then it opens the component debug window. So that one again provides the ID, a nick field, the network name, and the list of the connected components. So as I already mentioned, with the nick field you can change the nick or uh, or the uh, yeah the you can change the nick basically of that um, component. Important to know this that it's not just one. Nick. So if we take splitter so that is now the nick if you then type space and then take another nick like test so this component now has two nicks it has the splitter nick and the test nick so now let's go out of there and it's connected and now let's go in here so uh, we don't have uh, given the panel a name yet, so let's just give it pretty quickly a name Nick so we can search it Also, by the way, if you hold a control and click with the network manager It copies the ID of that component to your clipboard You can also just name something to, uh, Copy uh, copy something into your clipboard and if you look at uh, with the network manager at something and hold shift and click then you will change the nick of that co uh, of that component directly to your clipboard uh, clipboard contents. So let's just change this again. There we go. So as you can see, since it uh, now tries to interact with it as a network component, we can't open the UI. You can hold, uh, you can hit escape, and then you will be able to interact with it. And hit escape uh, back again, and you won't be able to interact with it. Also, uh, you can just get rid of it, and then it also looks small. So if you now go in here, you can now code some stuff. So for example, you can go to component.proxy. This fun so the component API allows you basically to interact with the component network or the computer network and the proxy function allows you to get the instance of a network component by ID so simple so we take in uh, we copy now the ID from the panel so by clicking onto the panel and then we can just uh, paste it in here and now with the component proxy we get the instance of that panel so now we can use functions of the panel so let's print out what we can do so for that, we provide uh, for, for any kind of instance a get members function. That one will return an array of strings, and those strings will then contain the name of members, like properties and functions, because instances provide functions and also properties you can write and read to. The, but those will then dynamically change the stuff of the uh, given instance, or the network component, or whatever. There are not many properties yet, there will be more properties later on, but just that you are aware there are properties. So now if we run this code, 
we can see okay we have id we have nick and we have some uh, other stuff id and nick are standard properties for network components so if if the instance is a network component it will contain an id property and a nick property the id property is stat uh, is read only is a string and that is basically the id of the component and the nick component is not read only you can write to it which is also a string and that is just simply the nick of the component and then you can also see a couple of functions we can interact with. The function we are interested in is the getModule function. So now let's take the, beat, uh, the button from the panel. So now we, ex uh, we call it uh, this function, which is a member function, so that's why we will need to use the double point, because that's the method access point uh, operator of Lua. Then you call getModule. And get module takes three arguments depending on uh, which kind of panel you are. We have the normal large control panel, so that's why we ch actually just need two values because the last value automatically gets uh, gets initialized with zero. And we don't need more, so we just take um, two values. So the first one is the x coordinate of the module we're searching for, and that is the y coordinate of the module we're searching for. So our button is located in the center. So x coordinate is on the bottom, the horizontal line. So we start with 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So the x coordinate is of the button is 5. Now let's check the uh, y axis. So 1, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Also 5. So now we know, okay, x coordinate was 5 and y coordinate was 5. And with that we get the, uh, we get the button. We can also print the button, by the way or the panel just to check what types they are so as you can see the output is different so if it is a network component it will show the type which is just an object right now uh, that's that's a problem with the internal uh, handling because basically we have multiple different objects getting merged together and object and the adapter is in this case just a simple object that's why it doesn't stay constructed then the next thing is the nick of that network component so if it is a network component it will show those two values too which is the nick string and which is the id of that string and if it's just some kind of object then it will just show the object so now let's uh, interact with the button. So let's print out the members of the button. In pairs, btn, get members, do. Then we take print. So we can print now the member string. And we need to end the for loop, run it. And you can see, okay, so we got id and nick again. But those, uh, those will tell you that they are invalid because it's not a network component. Then we have again some functions. There are many different standard functions for different kinds of uh, for different kinds of uh, instance types, uh, and uh, those are standard for any kind of actor basically. But this trigger and set color are specific to the button. We are now right now interested in set color. So if we go in here and we call this set color function. The set color function will take four different uh, four different parameters, so the color in RGB uh, uh, RGB values and then an emissive value. The RGB values can range from zero to one, and the R uh, and the emissive value can change from zero to five. So, for example, if we want, uh, as you can see, the button head is green. We now want to change it to red. So, with that, we need to provide the color code for red. So, red is one. Green is zero, blue is zero, and we can also provide an emissive value like one, five, or whatever. Let's just take one in that case. Rounded code. You can see we got some bugs here. Oh yeah, because I tried to access M, but we need to access BTN. So let's just do that pretty quickly. So now it's rounded code. And as you can see, that button is red. Nice. The network also allows you to take uh, in some push signals. So what does that mean? 
So right now, you would need to constantly uh, take a while true loop and then always use a getter function to get the status of some kind of object and then check if it has changed over time and then you can do something different if it has changed for example. But you don't need to do that. Instead you can use the uh, you can use the signal system. So for example, we want to get a signal when you push that button. What we need to do is we need to take the but uh, button again. Why have I removed it? I don't know. Um, that is panel get module. That takes um, five five. And now we want to listen to that button for every kind of signal you get from it. With that you can say event dot listen. So this is the event API, and you want to listen to an uh, object which is the BTN. You can also then stop listening to the button by using the event dot ignore function. Or if you want to stop listening to any kind of object, you can call ignore all. If ignore all doesn't properly work, immediately tell me about that issue. Cause we need to use caching for that, uh, for that, and that would mean that the cache me well, is messed up. I so that should not happen. But if there is something that, or generally. If you find any kind of issue, bug or whatever, tell me immediately about it on Discord or on the GitHub issue page. So we can work out a fix for it. So now with that said, uh, we now listen to that button. So next step is we start a while true loop. Because we always want to get notified when we trigger an event. Okay? And because if we now wait for an event to occur, the function will then just return and the program will reach the end. And with the while true loop, this won't happen. It will then do the same thing again. So what we can do is we can now print events.pull and with that we pull something from the event queue. Because the computer has an internal queue of signals, so I think the size is 32 you will be able to change it with a configuration file later on, but run out the uh, maximum size is 32. So if a component, if you listen to a component and the component uh, pushes a signal, this will push uh, get pushed to the queue. And if the queue is full, the signal will simply get dropped. So make always sure that your signal queue is empty if you want to get signals. You can also, for example, take the event. Um, I think it was clear or empty, I'm not sure exactly, which will simply clear the whole signal queue for you. Next up is, uh, so we now just simply pull. We don't provide on any argument, that will mean it will wait infinitely until a signal is reached or you simply stop the computer. So if we run this now, then, we ca uh, then you can see nothing is in the console. So. Uh, event pull by the way also returns the parameters of the signal. There are two parameters that will uh, will be there in, at, uh, for every signal, and then random pa uh, and then different parameters depending on the different kinds of signals uh, got sent. So the first parameter is an event parameter. So you can just simply do that by uh, you can get access to this by this here. So the first parameter, E, is a string of the name of the signal. So you can differentiate different kinds of signals. S is the sender of the signal, so that will be in our case BTN. And arc is then just the, re uh, the thing depending on the signal you sent. Uh, but uh, we now just simply print everything we return from that pull function. When it returns, we print everything there is. So now, if we trigger that button, you can see we have a trigger. Uh, the uh, the uh, event name was trigger, and the sender was an actor, which is our button. And we can do that now multiple times. Click, 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 click. And we got multiple triggers. Very nice. 
So what we can also do is we can add a timer. So if you set the timer to zero, this will just simply um, check if something is in the queue and if there was there is something in the queue it will return it immediately and if there is nothing in the queue it's again returns immediately but won't push anything to the lure stack or it will simply don't return anything as you can see it doesn't print anything because it immediately returns with nothing on uh, with, uh, with returning nothing if you take zero, uh, if you have a uh, number bigger than zero, something like that, it will wait this amount of time in real time. So if we take one, it will try, it will wait a maximum amount of one second for uh, to get a signal. If in this one second no signal is reached, it will return again without uh, with returning nothing. But if a signal is reached directly, uh, so if you if it goes to the pool and there is already a signal on the stack, it will return immediately in the same lure tick. If that's not the case, it will wait as long as the signal, um, if there is a signal, and if let's say after half a second there is a signal, then it will return uh, the according parameters. So now we also need to talk about the lure tick. So there is um, some specialty in here which you need to be aware of. So there are things that are called API returns. API returns basically can cause the Lua runtime to yield. We need to yield the Lua runtime after a specific amount of Lua code instructions so that it doesn't block the game from running. So that means you need to be you need to be aware of how long your program takes to process. Most functions provided by Fixed Networks for you to interact with some kind of stuff like event listen, panel get module, component proxy, event pull, print, all of them have a API return in the end. This API return handles stuff differently. So a Lua tick, so basically you have a game tick and in that game tick we have a couple of Lua ticks or, or we might have a lure tick, and that lure tick is uh, is um, split up in two stages. The first stage is the um, in the first stage, every uh, API return will just simply work like a normal return, and nothing will happen to the lure runtime. It will just return the data, and it will run. It will keep running. But if we reach the second tick stage, by the way, the size of each the state uh, depends on the Lua instructions. So, for example, after 5000 Lua instructions, we will then reach the second tick stage. This depends on the CPU you use or, or the in game CPU you use. So, the uh, second stage will then, um, uh, will then just simply again run the Lua code. But if you reach a uh, API return, this API return will cause the Lua runtime to yield. We need to yield because if you are at the end of the second stage, the comp uh, the in-game computer will crash with an out-of-time exception. Let me show you this. We now have a while true loop without an API return in there. And if we run that, we have an out-of-time exception. Because this is insufficient, it would have ru uh, keep running forever and would block the game. So after a cup, uh, after some time, after some Lua instructions have passed, if you reach that end, it will crash. So that means you need to make sure that you have somewhere a Lua API return. Now the problem might be that you have a very big arithmetic complex function you need to solve, or whatever, and you don't do any Lua API returns like prints or whatever because that would be unnecessary still have one option to use uh, to call it manually the uh, event return so with that you can just um, trigger it yourself and this would be in our case uh, computer.skip and with that function that is just a plain API return nothing returning actually but it will yield if it's in the, sec in the second stage of the lure tick so if you run that code now you can see it keeps running because sometimes when it needs, it yields. 
so that uh, that's uh, that covers the basics of uh, setting up the first computer network for fixed networks hope you enjoyed it and i hope you have quite some fun see you in the next time and as always keep coding <laughs>